Now, allow me to turn the podium over to Alyssa Ayers, Dean of the Elliott School, Professor of History, expert on South Asia, and former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Bureau for South and Central Asian Affairs at the State Department. And most importantly, a great colleague, leader, and friend, Alyssa. James, thank you so much, and good morning, everyone. We're so happy to be able to welcome you all here this morning, and we're very, very happy to be able to welcome Professor Eunice back to, virtually, back to the Elliott School. Um, Professor Eunice, as I think you all know, you're all here to hear from him, is just an extraordinary example of the impact that an individual can have on the world. He's an inspiration to us, to our students as our students prepare themselves to face the problems of today and the challenges of tomorrow. The power of Professor Eunice's ideas have helped transform Grumman Bank and the use of microcredit and social business into one of the most effective forces of empowerment in global history. It's that idea, the power of the idea that small increases in financial capacity for the poor, combined with the empowerment that comes from entrepreneurship, that has transformed the way NGOs, international financial institutions, and governments develop efforts to combat poverty, not only in Bangladesh, but now, of course, around the world. Now, you are all aware, but let me just re-emphasize, Professor Yunus's efforts have been widely recognized. He is one of less than 10 individuals in history who have received the Nobel Peace Prize, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and the Congressional Gold Medal. I was actually very privileged to be able to attend the awarding of the Congressional Gold Medal to Professor Eunice in the Capitol Rotunda during my junior yeah. government service about a decade ago. And it was a testament to the global impact that Professor Eunice has had here in the United States and certainly around the world. Professor Eunice was also awarded the highest George Washington University honor, the George Washington University President's Medal in 2016. Now, in the last two decades, Professor Eunice has written four books, all of which address microcredit, micro lending, and social business. The most recent of these was published in 2017, titled A World of Three Zeros, The New Economics of Zero Poverty, Zero Unemployment, and Zero Carbon Emissions. We're delighted to welcome him back today to talk about this idea of the world of three zeros. He'll be speaking about his, his thinking uh, about our economic system in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and the global challenges that the pandemic has helped highlight. He has an urgent call to action and his focus is on the power of creative thinking tied to the energy of youth. So it was a distinct pleasure to welcome him back to our campus where we work daily to educate future leaders of the world. I have one last thing I just wanted to note. I'm so pleased to share that our Grounding Bank and Trust Student Internship Program offers students a firsthand exposure at the work of economic empowerment through microcredit and social business and grants our students the opportunity to intern both here in Washington, D.C., in Bangladesh, as well as virtually. So we're deeply, deeply grateful to Elliott School alum Chris Fosner for his support of this internship program over the years and to Jane Ives for her continued leadership of the internship program. I encourage all of our students, all of you here, all of you uh, watching remotely, to consider applying for the Grammy Bank and Trust Student Internship as you think about your professional development. So thank you for joining us, Professor Eunice. We look forward to hearing your thoughts and engaging with you on questions of poverty, climate change, and unemployment. And the floor is now yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for this warm introduction. And uh, I thought uh, I didn't uh, have to have an introduction because I feel like I'm a part of the families. So we've been together for many, many years now. And I'm very happy that uh, this internship program that continues students from uh, George Washington University coming to Bangladesh. There's a wonderful relationship that built up through their visits, their connectivity. And I had the chance to come repeatedly uh, to address the students on the campus. Sorry that I couldn't come for the last few years because of the recently about the COVID-19 and all that. So I'm very happy today because uh, I'm with the family that I've been uh, working together on uh, issues that we raise and discuss together. What I'll do, I'll try to um, show uh, how all the things I did developed. It's not something that I designed it and tried to experiment with it. And it's not like that. Uh, first of all, many of the things happen accidentally. It was not pre-planned at all. 
uh, completely. For example, I never wanted or even uh, thought about becoming a banker in my life. That was a, a, the least thing I would ever think in my mind that I'll be a banker. Uh, but somehow I became a banker. The, uh, people call me banker to the poor or whatever. But uh, I'm introduced as a banker. So uh, this was not something I was looking for. And uh, this is not something I planned for. Uh, so I got into things which took me into the direction without knowing what I was doing, which direction I was going. Uh, finally, I saw myself surrounded by uh, issues of banking and then raising questions about it. Uh, this is how, and then I was busy doing things, uh, arguing with people, why it should be, or why the other things should not be, and so on. And in the meantime, I was doing something else without realizing that this will lead me to some other things. So the, I didn't have a, a clear uh, plan. Uh, it just took steps, smaller steps, as it came and uh, tried to address that problem or address whatever I was doing in, in that direction. This is how my steps began. I didn't have any strategy of such nature because uh, I had no idea uh, what the goal is, what the objective is, except one, solve the problem of the people, particularly poor people. That was the overriding thing, but it came in the fractions, not as a total totality of it. Uh, the first thing was about the massive poverty that existed in Bangladesh uh, back in 1970s, middle of 70s, when Bangladesh became independent country separating from Pakistan. We became a separate country in 1971, um, declaring ourselves independent from Pakistan. And then we got into a terrible uh, economic uh, problems. Uh, our economy um, sunk to the bottom. Uh, we had a terrible famine in the country in 1974. I came back from the United States where I was teaching uh, in 1971 because I thought um, now that the country became independent, uh, I should be back in the country uh, rather than teaching here in this United States. So I came, came back uh, and I saw uh, how, what terrible thing the famine is, how people die of a shortage of food because they cannot feed themselves. It's not just one or two. You see it on the streets every, almost every day, dead bodies lying around. So you are shocked that you never heard of it. You never read about it. Never, classroom studies never tell you things to, like this can happen, how to address them. So I was kind of uh, uh, upset and I was angry with myself for learning something which has no use for people, uh, learning economics. I said economics is a use, worthless subject. I wasted my time learning it. Uh, so I have to now uh, reorganize myself to learn something which, which will make me useful to people. I didn't know how to do that. One thing I did, I said I should go to the village next door uh, to the campus and see if I can be useful to at least one person as a human being. Nobody taught me how to do it, but as a human being, maybe I can find a way to relate to other people. So, so this was the beginning. I had no clear idea what I can do. I was looking for something that I can do for, for that particular day for at least one person, see how I can make myself useful in that sense. So I did a lot of little things in that way and I feel very comfortable that yes, I'm now becoming a little bit of usefulness in me, discovering a little bit of usefulness in me. And that's how it all began. And a long short, a long story is uh, ultimately uh, I became very familiar with the village and I was trying to see uh, what are the problems they had. One problem kept repeating, repeatedly coming to me, loan sharking in the village. So I was trying to see how to uh, address the, uh, the loan sharking by protecting at least one or two people from the loan sharks. It's a terrible, terrible thing the loan sharks do to the people. They grab everything the other person has. So I said, how do I protect them? And that's the beginning of my uh, attention to the lending process. So one idea that came that, uh, why don't I lend the money myself? Uh, uh, if I do the lending, then people don't have to go to, the, at least some people don't have to go to the loan shark. They can come to me and I can give the money uh, in a very simple way rather than grab everything from them. And I explained to people in the village, if you want to take money, if you need money, come to me, I can help you. I can lend you the money. So I, I was looking for five or 10 such person who will be able to, I, I'll be able to give them the money and they were willing to take the money. But it became very popular. 
then I became very happy that at least I'm useful in that particular they, 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 are, they don't have to be uh, victims of loan sharks. I'm protecting them from being loan shark. And then it led to the controversy with the banking. I raised the question, basic question about banking. I said, why don't you lend the money to the poor people? They kept saying that they are not credit worthy. So I kept repeatedly hearing that they are not credit worthy. That's an explanation. So I raised the question to the banks. I said, is it correct to uh, uh, kind of describe people, accuse people that they are, you cannot serve them because not credit worthy? Or people should be accusing you that you are not people worthy. You don't know how to do business with them. Look, I'm lending money and I don't feel any problem with them and they don't feel any problem with me. Uh, so I don't see uh, that's a problem with you. So this is how we continued. And, and the later story that it became bigger, bigger and created a bank called Grameen Bank. And how what is the Grameen Bank actually? What does it do? It's step-by-step step that we did. If you look back, it's almost the reverse of the conventional bank. Mm -hmm. Conventional bank go to the rich, Grameen Bank goes to the poor. Conventional bank goes to uh, men, Grameen Bank goes to the women in the rural areas most distant rural areas, terrible, uh, poor, terribly poor rural areas. Uh, conventional banks want people to come to their premises to business. Uh, Grameen Bank says people should not come to the bank, banks should go to the people. We deliver the service at your doorstep. And that makes it very convenient for people, particularly for women. They don't have to leave their homes to go to the bank and they have no idea what this bank is. So they don't have to see our office. We don't have, they don't have to see all the, things that goes into an office, they just see the guy who comes around and um, just treat him just another person. And this is how the whole thing began. And then with the whole idea of collateral, we dismissed the whole idea of collateral. So banks want collateral, we said no collateral. Uh, that's a fundamental change that we did that the, the entire banking system. They said it will collapse without, bank, without uh, collateral, you cannot function. I said, we'll continue as long as we can. If you collapse, you'll find out how to address ourselves in that. Maybe we have to come back to the collateral again, but until then we'll continue. And we continued, nothing happened. So this is how it continues and uh, continues. And we became the lawyer-free bank. There's no lawyer in our banking. We, they said, well, you give a small loans so or you may not need a lawyer. But today uh, we lend uh, every year more than $3 billion every year. Uh, and with no collateral. So if the money comes back, that's what makes Grameen Bank famous, that it's a repayment rate is over 97%, 98% of the repayment rate. Now we work in the United States called Grameen America, and we have been doing that for the last 13 years. We have given over 13, sorry, $3 billion worth of money, uh, and with a repayment rate of 99.5% and above over the whole period. So this is how demonstrated and now. So this is the one that we challenged the banking system. We created something as an alternative, as a reverse of the banking system. Then we started looking at other things because the poor people need many other things. First, first thing that came to us is the healthcare. So we wanted to create healthcare program for them. Uh, we created the nutrition program for them. We started selling seeds uh, for vegetables so that ch children can have vegetables uh, and address the problem of malnutrition, particularly of vitamin A deficiency, night blindness and other uh, problems that have, we had in Bangladesh at that time. Uh, so this we did as a business to sell uh, uh, vegetable seeds. Then we got into toilets. There's no toilet in the village, so we created a company business to sell toilets. And Grameen Bank gives the toilet loan and they set up the toilet because toilet is spreading diseases everywhere. Nobody uses toilet. Uh, there is no concept of toilet. So we introduced that and that made a very popular thing. Gradually, we went into creating a company to bring solar energy uh, so, uh, because they use kerosene and it's expensive item. They, uh, use and uh, we said, well, look, you give us the kerosene money every month, whatever you uh, spend on kerosene, and we give you uh, solar energy. And that became very popular. We reached a million subscribers or million buyers of this uh, uh, solar energy company, uh, solar system uh, within four years. And it became very popular because it's so clean and so easy. You don't have to clean anything because of the you're not using kerosene or something. And you have connected to the whole world because you have the electricity and so on. So these are done 
And we said, uh, people say, you must be a rich person, you're doing that. I said, no, I'm not doing it to make myself a rich person. I was just solving problem in a business way. Because I was always saying that uh, charity is a wonderful idea, but charity money goes out, does, it, does, does that wonderful thing, but it doesn't come back. So charity money has only one use. So what I'm trying to do, money that I'm using should be coming back to me so that I can use it again. So I came out with this business, business idea, but I'm not trying to make money for myself. So why, they say, why should, you make, why should you the business not to make money? I said, because I enjoy it. Uh, nobody will, they said, nobody will do it because uh, uh, they may not be feeling the same way. I said, maybe, maybe not, who knows? I said, uh, then what is the reason in, in a con conventional business, you make money, uh, that makes you very happy. The more money you make, more happy you get. I said, well, maybe what we are doing, making money may be happiness. May making other people happy is a super happiness because I feel super happy. Maybe like me, many other people will super feel super happy because they solve people's problem and people look at you and admire you, what you have done. And uh, you're not interested in making money for yourself because your happiness is coming from your work that you do. So that we described, this business we described because it just became such a controversy. We gave it a name, call it social business, non-dividend company to solve human problems without any interest in making money for yourself, you run a business. So that's very difficult to swallow because everybody has been drilled to le learn that business means maximization of profit. Uh, said, what is the difference between maximization profit and absolutely no profit personally, but company makes profit, profit is plowed back into the business so that it can grow. Then you can solve, continue to solve problem, you can have the creativity and so on. So we created that kind of thing and we continue to bring that idea. Later on, we have lots of social businesses and so on. Uh, the justification we tried to give, I said, look, entire economics is based on the definition of a human being, I think fundamentally wrong. And as a result, economics became a funda fundamentally wrong subject because it's, it's a basic foundation of economics is uh, the definition of human being as someone who is driven by self-interest. And that's a core. That's why the max profit maximization came out of it. Uh, I said, well, that's not correct interpretation of a human being. Human beings are driven by self-interest, also collective interest. That collective interest part, economists forgot, didn't include into it. So they, if they had included into it, they would have created an, another kind of business to create, uh, address the problem of collective interest. That's what I'm doing. Say, in, in, when you do the self-interest business, you maximize your profit because you're in interest to maximize. Uh, when we do the collective interest business, I'm not interested in making money. I'm interested in solving the problem. That's where the social business comes in. So the economics should be of two kinds of business. One to maximize profit and to maximize your uh, solving problems and uh, address the issue so that people don't have any problem left as you continue to do it. So this is how I started continuing that one after another. And I said, uh, when I did the micro credits, people asked me why people remain poor. What is the cause of poverty? So I thought about it and see, like try to understand what it is. So came up with the idea that uh, poverty is not created by the poor people. Poverty is created by the system that we have built. The system is at fault, not the poor people. How? Because poor people are deprived. How? Like for the finance, for example, we created microcredit uh, to fill one of those uh, gap the economics left behind uh, because they could do their own thing. They are not waiting for jobs. Uh, if you give the money, they will be, become uh, entrepreneur by themselves. Then the debate began whether human being all can be capable of becoming entrepreneurs. Uh, economics taught us that uh, some people are entrepreneurs, but most of the people have to work for them. And that's how the economy grows. I said, that's absolutely wrong. Uh, I started promoting the idea that uh, all human beings are born as entrepreneurs. Uh, economics to, told us wrong. Our institutions are built wrong. Our schools are built wrong to tell the young people, go and get a good job. If you come to this school, you get a good job. If you go to other school, you may not get that good job that you're looking for. Uh, so we are busy producing job-ready young people. I said, that's a shame. Human beings are creative people and creativity goes with entrepreneurship. 
uh, you surrender your entrepreneurship when you become a job seeker, when you become a uh, job holder, because you're, you're run by instruction. That's a damage you do to the whole world because you sacrifice your own unl uh, unlimited creativity that you are packed with uh, by nature. And then you surrender it. I said, that's a shame for everybody that uh, economics could, could do such a thing. So the argument remains that can all everybody became entrepreneur. I said, don't tell me now. After I've done the microcredit and it's your work, all these nine million bought, oh, nine, nearly 10 million now, 10 million borrowers in Grameen Bank, uh, they are not taking money to become job seekers. They all become entrepreneurs. If a small little loan can give them uh, the opportunity to become entrepreneurs and show the entrepreneurship, they didn't go to any business school or they didn't go to any uh, colleges to learn about business and so on. It is in it is inside of them. Simply they couldn't express it. The moment we provide the money, they started discovering their capacity to do that. And it's not for one year or two years, it's a lifelong thing. They didn't say, okay, now we have enough money, let's go and take a job. They don't do that. They just continue with it explore, and they continue to explore, explore themselves and their capacity. I said, this proves if 10 million illiterate women in poor country like Bangladesh at that time, at least poor country, now it's not a poor country, uh, uh, can become uh, entrepreneurs, anybody in the world can become entrepreneurs. I said, the missing thing is the money, financial service. If you provide the financial service, then everybody can unleash their energy. They don't have to depend on anybody. They don't have to depend on welfare. They don't have to do well, uh, un unemployment benefits or something like that. They can take care of themselves. They have enough creativity to figure out how to do that. I said, it's financial service is the oxygen for human being. And the moment you provide the oxygen, they become alert, they become active, they continue to do that. If you withdraw that oxygen, they become absolutely useless because they don't know what to do. Else, the basic ingredient is missing. So we continue to argue that. Then we start looking at the global issue, which has started hitting us about the global warming and other things. I said all this because we misinterpreted the uh, human beings as, as an active ingredient of the whole uh, world that they want to build themselves. And uh, this, this uh, civilization is built on this economic premises that we believed in and we continue to do that. As a result, we created global warming. Global warming is not created by God. Global warming is created by us through our businesses, through our belief that we do whatever I described, what economics has misled us into, and we created all this problem. So if, in order to address this issue, we have to undo all the things that we believed in. Uh, and not only it has created this uh, messy problem for us, it's also created the problem of uh, wealth concentration. All the wealth goes in one direction. That's what the economic machine. Economic machine doesn't know how to bring wealth from the top to the bottom. Economic machine knows how to take the wealth from the bottom to the top. So the concentration process continues. It's a global process. It's a national process. It's a regional process everywhere. Money goes, money always leads to the top. Uh, more than 95%, uh, 98% of the wealth uh, is held by only a handful of people at the top. Uh, the remaining balance what we got is left for the uh, 95 or 95 percent of the people uh, who will be taking uh, will access to four percent five percent of the wealth of the country and region by region you see that that wealth concentration continues uh, the machine is what is built is the one which pumps the wealth to the top so you until you redesign the machine this will process will continue so we have to rebuild the machine. We have to design a machine which will bring the wealth to the people, not away from the people. Today, the distance between the wealth and the people is wider and getting wider and wider. So we have to design system which will bring the wealth and the people together. They will be together. They will overlap with each other rather than distance from themselves, distance, creating distance from them. I said, this is a part of the machine that we built. So we could talk about it. We make a little correction here, make a little correction there, but the machine remains something. I said, no, we have to undo the machine. We have to forget the machine. We have to build a new machine. And that's what we have, wealth concentration. And the question of unemployment and the question of artificial intelligence creating massive unemployment and so on. So I said, what we have to do, the present design of the machine have to be abandoned, create a new machine, new design, and create a new civilization. This civilization is built on profit maximization. 
is a profit-centric civilization. So we have to go back and discover ourselves as a human being. This civilization has turned us into money-making machines. We are not machines. We are not robots. We are human beings. We forgot that. So we have to discover ourselves as a human being, discover ourselves with human values, and create a civilization based on human values, where we share things. We do things together. And that's where the social business, that's where the entrepreneurship, that's where the solving problems and so on, redesign the system and switch from the old civilization to the new civilization. Uh, it's very urgent because old civilization is going to destroy us through global, global warming. Date is almost fixed. We are coming to the finishing line. We can't survive very long. That's very clear. We don't talk it very loudly. But that's what we are heading for. And there's no scope to escape from that as long as we remain with, stuck with the old ideas. So we have to fresh, create the fresh machine and do that. And that's where we say in the new civilization, we create a world of three zeros. What are the three zeros? Zero net carbon emission, zero wealth concentration, and zero unemployment. That's the three zero we want to build. And that will be the creation of the three, three zero world. Then we bring it to the young people. I said, the young people are the one who can design this and continue to work for it because the old, old people's thinking is contaminated thinking. The old ideas are clocked into their heads. So the, the fresh thinking will come from the young people and create those world kind of concepts and institutions and policies to create this new engine of the world, uh, economy to create that world. So what we are encouraging young people to create three zero clubs. We said any five young people can get together and create themselves into a three zero club. And we to facilitate them, we have our website where you can register yourself so that you can get connected with other three zero clubs around the world. Uh, continue. The, what is the purpose of the three zero club? Purpose of the three zero club is to turn yourself into three zero person. I said all the problems that we created is not coming from the sky. It's creating from me and you. I, I consume fossil fuel. That's why fossil fuel became a problem. Uh, if I don't start, uh, if I don't consume fossil fuel, it will not be here to create more global warming. No matter what the companies are doing, companies cannot do anything if I don't buy from them. Uh, so I have to correct myself. So I become a, I start reducing my consumption of fossil fuel, consumption of uh, plastics, consumption of other things which lead to the global warming. And not only I reduce, I promise myself to come to a zero point. I will not contribute at all. So I become a zero contributor to global warming, zero contributor to wealth concentration, zero contributor to uh, unemployment. I become a three zero person. And all five of us become three zero person. Hopefully they will come to the three zero families, three zero villages, three zero cities, and ultimately it will be a three zero world. So this is where little step can create a big, big difference in the world. So this is the whole gist of the entire thing that I've been doing. And I'll stop here and let you ask questions. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent, so I know we're going to continue facing wonderful, fabulous technological problems. So I'll move away from the speaker and ask if there are questions here in the audience. Yes, we have one from Gabrielle. You're in the internship program now, aren't you? Yes, hi, my name is Gabrielle. Wait, wait, for, the mic, wait for the mic, but oh, if people okay. could probably hear, but we'll see. Hi, Dr. Yunus, my name is Gabrielle Goldfarb. I'm currently an intern with the Yunus Center. I'm working under SHEHAB. He has been so wonderful. Um, so Good. thank you for working with our school for the internship program. My question for you is there has been a huge rise in ESG funds, um, social impact ventures, corporate social responsibility programs. And I'm wondering if you believe that those efforts combined with the current development um, agencies and operations would be enough to move the needle significantly on poverty alleviation and how those two entities, the private sector, um, social responsibility efforts and development agencies can work better together more cohesively to move the needle. Yeah. Oh, that's good that people become conscious about the social entrepreneurship, social enterprise, and so on and so forth. And that's a good idea. But the one thing that I try to uh, address and uh, point out that sometimes it's not very clear when you say it is a social impact, my company is doing social impact, and so on. When the moment you say social enterprise and social impact, 
you are actually trying to say i do the business to mix profit and social this is a mixture of both uh, that's the whole idea of all these names uh, when you mix something you have to be very clear uh, at what ratio are you talking about 99% profit and 1% social or the other way around 99% social 1% profit because your word doesn't explain anything uh, or maybe 50% social 50% profit or you started as 99% social and 1% profit but gradually moved into more profit than social and nobody knows about it but you call yourself social impact and social enterprise and so on and so forth. So I said it's a very risky thing. That heading doesn't tell us much. So I said we took a safest uh, position, it's very clear position. In our case, there is no profit at all. Always personal profit is zero. Uh, there's no compromise on that. So whether we are talking today or 20 years later, we have the same in our, in our company law. We integrate this in our company law. This company will never give any dividends. It's a non-dividend company. Uh, that means it may make profit, uh, but the profit will stay with the company to be reinvested in the cause that we are devoted to, uh, devoted ourselves into doing that. Like I was talking about the healthcare. Healthcare is a massive issue. We have been working in social business, healthcare in many, many different ways. Uh, and we have been doing this uh, solar energy and so on and so forth, energy wise, and other many others uh, things. So these are uh, the kind of <laughs> examples that we see. So I would say these are uh, good ideas. Uh, at least they are conscious about the, to do this, but not sacrificing their uh, intention of making personal profit. And profit is such a strong element. If you mix profit and social, uh, gradually, the, because the circumstance environment in which we live, uh, the profit part will become stronger and stronger, and social part will become smaller and smaller. Still, you call yourself uh, social enterprise and so on. So that's a risky path. Uh, I hope somebody who runs that can uh, stay firm and know exactly what they want to do on the social and uh, mixing social and profit, uh, profit together. But it's a, it's a very slippery path. Thank you. Thank you. So other questions here? I see in the back. Yes, please. Um, hi, my name is Anna Majoka. I'm with the World Bank. Um, I have a like, question about the work of cooperatives. So you mentioned that there are like two types of economies. One is for profit maximization and the other one is for like the community interest that focuses on that. But I think like worker cooperatives like bring both of them together. I just would love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, cooperative is a great idea when uh, everybody's making money, the idea of serving the people with uh, solving their problem through creating cooperative. That's how the cooperative movements came because nobody was paying attention to the small guys. Uh, so the small guys got together and created cooperative for themselves. So that's a good idea to do that. So the, the question is whether the purpose of the cooperative, rich men can create a cooperative too, although it has started with poor people, uh, the kind of uh, people who are rejected people by the system. Uh, but the concept is available to the rich people too. They can gang up and call themselves cooperative and make lots of money for themselves. Uh, so cooperative itself, doesn't uh, the concept itself doesn't protect me uh, it, it's open for exploitation by uh, rich people and so on uh, and cooperative even like the middle income and the low low income people can become a, uh, an instrument of exploitation too because they want to make money for themselves everybody in the cooperative wants to take bigger profit out of the cooperative and so on so then it's a cooperative is not the kind of thing i'm talking about they are simply small people got together to exploit other small people or big people or whatever it is uh, they want to uh, get more money so it's a question of what use you make of the cooperative if the cooperative says this is a non dividend co cooperative i shake hands with them yes that's what we do you have created a cooperative but that's very clearly defined that the intention of this cooperative is not to make money. Its intention is to solve problem. Thank you. Thank you. Now, do I see someone else here with a question? Yes, right over here. Thank you. Hello, Arginus. Hello. Thank you so much Hi. for a great talk. I'm uh, Thomas. I had the pleasure of interning, uh, taking part in the internship, internship program this summer and worked with one of the partners. Um, okay. During your talk, I was um, thinking about when you mentioned the Grameen 
expanding a little bit and even having activities here in the United States. I think you yeah. call it Grameen America. Could you elaborate right. a little bit on those activities and potentially yeah. any yeah. expansion beyond that? Yeah. Grameen America started in 2008. One person said, why don't you bring the uh, microcredit in the United States? I said, I'll be delighted to do it if somebody finances it. He said, I'll finance it. So that's how it began in uh, Jackson Heights, New York in 2008. And that was the beginning. Now it has expanded in uh, 32 cities around the United States. Um, so we have a long experience of uh, 14 years now uh, running this uh, microcredit program in, in the USA. Uh, started with mostly uh, immigrants, uh, particularly uh, Latino immigrants. And it's a very interesting experience for us. These are not only poor people, they are not only we focused on women, uh, they don't even have uh, documents. Not only we don't need any uh, collateral, uh, we don't need any uh, documents too. So th these are all mostly undocumented people, but we gave them the money. Over the years, uh, we have given uh, more than $3 billion in loans. Uh, the, the repayment toward the whole period uh, is over 99.5% and more. Uh, never faltered without that. And now it is expanding uh, in more cities. And the project has the growth rate they have. Uh, they will be re cumulatively, they will be investing $20 billion in the next 10 years. So this is the kind of the growth pattern that they have. And they maintain that. Uh, now it started with the um, immigrants, but now is the traditional Black community and other communities are also. Mm -hmm. Uh, engaged in this microcredit program. So we are very happy with that. And it's a self, most amazing thing, these are self-sustaining. It's not something somebody, donor people give the money and they take care of it and the cost has to be borne by somebody else or money doesn't come back. So somebody has to take care of it. So every single branch comes to the 100% uh, financially sustainable within three to four years. So after that, they continue to grow and uh, make the, surpluses to be used, invested in another branch or other things and so on. So that's uh, uh, my uh, uh, Grameen America headquartered in New York City, uh, but it will be very happy if you look at the website and find out what's going on and how this is being done. Thank you so much. How much time more do we have with you, Dr. Uh, I was told it's about uh, one hour, so we'll have about another 15 minutes. Fantastic. Okay, we have two questions from the audience. Would you like to go ahead sure. and uh, yeah, let's ask... do that? Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Yunus. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Yunus. There are a couple of questions that have come in from our virtual audience. Uh, the first is that conventional banks have the problems of irrecoverable loans. Yeah. Did Grameen banks come across the problem of irrecoverable loans? And if so, how did they manage it? Yeah, this is what I was trying to explain that uh, I was giving the history of Grameen America. Forget about Grameen Bank, Bangladesh and Grameen America, 14 years that we are working there. Uh, the payment rate overall is uh, always 99.5% uh, and above. It's never below 99.5%, uh, except for one year, 2020, when the COVID-19 got in. So the repayment sharply declined right away. But by the end of 2020, again, it's picked up and went back to the uh, same level as 99.5% and so on. So uh, there is no such risk uh, in microcredit and so on, at least uh, the one that we are talking about in uh, Gamin America. And in Bangladesh, uh, Gamin America, Gamin Bank became known for that purpose, that you give loans to the poor people, they pay back. Uh, repayment rate is 97%, 98%, never below that. Uh, so you... Uh, have bad loans, but this bad loans you uh, write off from your book, but uh, those loans come, uh, those which you have already written off, they come back later. You didn't get it within the time period that you are defined for, uh, but that doesn't mean that money disappeared. You already covered your cost and everything is done, but two years later, three years later, she's already paying back whatever money she couldn't pay back in that year one, year two, and so on. Now in third year, she said, here's the money, I can get you it back. So I can start again because she knows if she cannot clear it, she cannot get another loan. And for her, it's very important to keep the door open for money because nobody else gives them the money with the same terms and conditions and same facilities 
that the government offers. So she comes back. So money ultimately comes back, but all, uh, you can say that uh, there are 2%, 3% uh, uh, bad loans, current bad loans, so which will be paid back later on. But even in a current bad loans, you re recover your, you cover your cost and so on. You become financial. The important thing, you become financially sustainable. You create surplus. And that's a genuine uh, feature of uh, microcredit. If some microcredit has a huge um, bad debt, that means it's not working. There are seasons when you have bad debts. We allow for that. Uh, like you have the COVID-19. Uh, we are not asking for people to pay back the money. People were scared. Even in the USA, I was visiting Manhattan branch uh, about three weeks back. Uh, I was there in Manhattan branch and the Bronx branches. Uh, the common thing the women said, uh, we are so scared when the COVID-19 came, this is, we thought our life is over now because bank will come, the I mean, America will come to take the money back and we can't be able to pay back and they will never pay us money. As we are such a sh shock for us when I mean, America came back and said, do you need more money? They didn't say, give me the money. They said, do you need more money? They gave us more money to survive ourselves and so on. And we are so pleased that the, at the time of crisis, they came and gave us the money. And this happens because of the tradition of Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. The flood is a recurrent thing. When the flood comes, everything stops. We said, don't worry about it. Your income is lost, everything, just stay hold. If you, when the flood is gone, first thing is to build, rebuild your house and so on. And we give you the money to do that so that you can start all over again and your business money also coming. So that you can, our idea is if you can stand on your feet, then everything will be. If you cannot stand on your feet, no use for this bank. This is a worthless bank because that bank couldn't come when I needed the money most. They refused to give the money. Rather, they are asking back the money. So that's a common theme that I heard uh, when the women were explaining how their experience was during the COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you. So questions here in the room. I see one up front and one on the side. Let's, okay, we'll start on the side then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Millery Hopkins. I'm an alum of the Elliott School and wanted to ask uh, Dr. Yunus, what innovations are you um, seeing in the field of microfinance that you're most excited about and how do you see the field evolving in the next decade? Since we are pressed for time, let's have the second question right over here in front at the same time. Go ahead. Hello. Hello, my name is Christina Hello. Hello. I, uh, I'm very glad that you're uh, joining us today. And my question was, I've done uh, some re research about how technology can help reach uh, for microcredit and um, just feedbacking on uh, repayment. Do you think that providing more technology and uh, will actually help? Or um, is there always going to be that gap? Um, okay. Thank you. Okay, so innovation and technology. Go ahead, Doctor. Yeah, on the first question about the conventional banks, whether they are adopting and so on. You know, we have been doing this microcredit domain bank for the last 45 years now. And it became known, we, it draw a lot of global attention and uh, you became interested, at George Washington University like that. Many other universities are teaching microcredit. Uh, they created you know, centers in social businesses in uh, universities uh, to teach uh, microcredit, social business and so on. So it is very admired, respected concept and so on. Uh, we thought after they've uh, successfully proven that yes, uh, poor people are credit worthy, they can be, uh, not only they can take the money and pay you back, and it's a very sustainable business. It's not something that you lose money by doing that. You made surplus and so on. Uh, after all this, still conventional banks remain away from them. We had to create Grameen America. No bank created Grameen America. Uh, so there, we can do the lending to the poor people and so on. After 14 years of our work that I was describing, no bank said, can I do something like that? Doesn't say that. So something amazingly strange within the banking system. They stay away from people who need their finance, need the entrepreneurship most. They stay away from that. And that's the issue that I raised 45 years back. I said, banking is a very strange thing. 
is supposed to lend money to people, but it does, does it in a very funny way. This is the quote that I'm making, what I said 45 or 40 years back. I keep repeating that. This is they are supposed to lend money, but they lend money to people who already have lots of money. And they don't lend money to people who don't have money. I said, this is very strange. It should be the other way. Banks should lend money to people who don't have money. After they have taken care of it, then they give the money to people who have little money, more money, and so on and so forth. I said, so the banks remain what they are. They would be, they would love to give you the money if you have lots and lots of money. And it's still, this is the same thing. So banking system is the cause of all the problems that we are creating right now. Global warming, uh, wealth concentration, and also unemployment. Uh, because it's a fundamentally designed in an absolutely wrong way. Until we redesign the banking system, the world is not going to fi be fixed. And I promote the one they say about the microcredit. I said, not only microcredit, even microcredit has been pushed in the wrong direction to make money from the poor people. I said, that's not what we did. We wanted to create microcredit domain bank as a social business. We didn't create a bank to make money for ourselves. We did it to solve people's problem. I had no intention of making personal money out of it. So we have to create a new financial system, which is a social business financial system. Their intention is to make everybody entrepreneur. And then they will come to the campuses that if you need money, start a business. We are here starting, we are waiting for you. Uh, you can do it while you're in school. You don't have to stop your education just because you run a business. You can run business while you're in school, no problem. So that's the kind of social businesses we'll be creating. In fin so financial world has to change. It has remained, as long as they remain, we are in a disaster path. Uh, we cannot get out. We are in suicidal path right now. And with that suicidal path, we cannot change if you cannot just change the basic pillars of this present civilization. And the finance is a basic filler, pillar of the financial system. So going back to the second one about the technology and so on. For technology, this is my position. Technology is a wonderful thing. But technology doesn't have its own mind. It's the user of the technology who has the mind. If user wants to make money by take, using, using the technology, they will make money. If the user is uh, to solve the problem of the people, technology will solve the people's problem. So technology doesn't have a mind. Technology can be a blessing. Technology can be a curse. Just because the technology is there, that, that, that didn't mean banks are rushed to the poor people. They didn't. I mean, America did. They took the technology so they don't have to handle cash, make it easy for them so that they can use the technology, uh, virtual payments and so on and so forth, uh, so that the cost goes down and people feel comfortable. They can pay wherever they are. Uh, they don't have to go to a particular location where somebody comes and take the cash, count the cash and put it disappeared completely. It's almost like a cashless system, the, the way it works right now. So they used it for the purpose of the people. But other kind of people, can uh, the loan sharks, uh, the, money, uh, the pay the lenders and so on, they can use the technology, grab more money from that of the people. So the technology doesn't solve the problem by itself. It's the people who will solve the problem. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, actually, Kyle, I'm going to go back to you for online question, please. Yes, thank you. So the question is uh, the following. In high-income countries such as the U.S., employment and hiring are predominantly degree-based. In your opinion, what kind of education will be required to help young people nurture their innate entrepreneurship so that they can grow into productive and responsible free zero? Right, right, right. right. Yeah, for example, uh, education system today is a system where you prepare young people to become successful job seekers. Uh, the more successful they are in seeking jobs, the more successful the institution is. Uh, you go to business schools, you prepare your young people to become executives in the businesses so that they can make more money uh, in the company they work for. So this is a job uh, seeking thing. Uh, so that system is, a, uh, the education system is turning young people into uh, job seekers because the very uh, design of the education is like that. I said, to begin with what we do in the uh, education system, there'll be two uh, kind of stream. One is stream who will become entrepreneur right from the beginning. You are, they, they will be asked as you enter, would you like to take uh, uh, stream A or stream B? 
Um, a is entrepreneurship, B is job seeking. So if you are uh, taking the path of the job uh, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, we'll give you the options, what are the courses, what kind of things you see, what, how the finance is done, how you get the finance, how you invest, you, what are the things, you, what are the issues that you can convert into, what are the different types of businesses, there are businesses to make money for yourself and be happy with it, or there are businesses called social business, you can solve the massive problem of the world by creating social businesses and so on. So we'll introduce everything, it's up to you, and then finance will be available to you, and you'll introduce the finance people to them. These are the guys. While in school, in the class, you can go and talk to them. They will immediately, if you have a good case, a good business plan, they will immediately uh, finance you. There's no problem with that. And you continue their courses. And you, you don't have to wait for a certificate at the end of your course so that you get a job. It's a job seeker need a certificate, but the entrepreneur doesn't need a certificate. So he, he's, he or she is not in a hurry to get a certificate. So he takes his time and find the courses that what he would do. So at the end, uh, the head of the institution doesn't say that uh, uh, we create job-ready young people. Uh, they will be saying, we create life-ready young people. This, these people will be playing a role in changing the life of the, of the world and so on and so forth. And within education system, something else has to happen. Uh, they have to discuss what is the purpose of life. This is a common theme that you have to do. What do we do with my life? I have a life, it's a very short period, but during this, what is that I do? Uh, so they will help me explore my own thinking, how to do that, how to do that. And what kind of world that I want to live in? So design a world that you want to live in. This will be part of education so that I know uh, what kind of world I want and what kind of life uh, I want to play, a uh, role I want to play in that world that I want to create. For myself. So these are the basic ingredients of education that the, who I am and what kind of life I want and what kind of world I want to build because I'm the builder of the world. I'm not a resident. I'm not a renting some space in the in this planet. I'm the creator of this planet. The things that I do. This is I, I give the example of I said it is a spaceship. World is a spaceship. Uh, now People are taught to be, treat themselves as passengers. We want to enjoy our life in this uh, spaceship. And uh, we want to see how to enhance or upgrade our life by moving from the economy class to the business class and first class and have a private jet and so on and so forth. So I said, no, you are not a passenger. You don't think of passenger thinking. You are the pilot of this ship. You, tell us, you have to figure out where you want to take this spaceship to. And if you are confused, I said, I give you a destination. You want to take it to the, maybe consider taking it to the three zero destination. That's, then you have to create the flight plans. How to do that? What kind of flight plans I need to have a world with the three zero and rediscover myself as a human being and be with the human being. And I feel proud that whatever time I had in this planet, I had used it the way I wanted it. And I feel happy that when I'm giving, uh, leaving, I know this is what I wanted to do and I did Pretty good. Thank you. So Dr. Yunus, I know that you're an economist. I know that you're a physician to the world's economy and someone who has now told us inspirational thoughts on how we should lead our own lives. I really appreciate your spending your time with us here today. Thank you audience for your great questions. Let's have a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I mean, I'm gonna hear a short message from your friend and ours, Chris Buster. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Professor Yunus. Yes, hello. For presenting a very important webinar at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. And thank you again for your continuing work with the George Washington University. Uh, Professor Yunus's work, very important. He has lifted over 125 million people out of poverty worldwide. This is a huge, a huge fact, a huge goal. And he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for this. He continues to work day-to-day uh, -day in this uh, endeavor to put Poverty in a museum. Okay. Uh, 
We at the George Washington University now are accepting uh, interns and we're accepting applications for interns to be in our program. And very important news, after many years of uh, suggesting and talking, we will start a UNIS initiative at the LA School of International Affairs, probably Q1 next year, still a, a work in progress. Also, some very good news, we're trying to work out another visit for Professor Yunus to go to George Washington University. His, uh, his, uh, his visit there years ago was most inspiring, and he spent a uh, full two days with student faculty and was award, awarded the highest uh, medal that George Washington University has. Again, thanks everyone. Thank you, Professor Yunus. Thank you. On a plane to Nepal. So, namaste. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. Thank you so much. Now, um, Jane, by the way, wanted to pop on and just say hello to a couple of the interns here. Jane, are you there? Can you pop on for a second? I am here. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Eunice. And I'm thank so you. glad that some of the interns are here. And I know that they'll have such a meaningful and important experience and hopefully add, I know, a lot of value to the Grameen Trust and to the UNIS Center. So thank you, both the interns, all of the interns, and thank you, Dr. UNIS, and, for, you. And, and it's a very meaningful opportunity. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Jane. And thank you from Washington, D.C. We'll see you next time, Dr. UNIS. See you thanks, next time. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Bye. Good night.